material for one of the oldest crafts in the world and for one of India's newest industries is dug out of the earth. It's clay, and round these rich deposits in Travancore, in Gwalior, in Bengal, pottery industries have grown up. The clay in these wagons will be made not into works of art for the rich buyer, but into cups, saucers, plates, good-looking, but at the same time cheap, for you and me. In the factory, the clay will be pummeled about and go through mysterious processes, and because the point of this new Indian industrial effort is mass production, the quantities of material used are huge. But clay is not the only ingredient of a cup, saucer or plate. There are several others, and one of them is hard white quartz. That's the stuff that sometimes pure gold is embedded in. Because it is so hard, so difficult to grind, it's taken off to be cooked. In the kiln, it stays for a day and a half, and then suddenly dipped into cold water. The experts call this quenching. Now that the quenching is over, the hardness of the quartz has gone, and huge quantities for a mass production factory can be ground down to a fine powder. That, then, is the second ingredient. The third ingredient is that aristocrat of stones, marble. And then the fourth and last ingredient, another stone called feldspar. You'll remember the line about the potter kneading his wet clay in the famous poem. Well, modern pottery making isn't quite so simple, and here the marble and feldspar and quartz are being mixed in a machine which may not inspire poetry, but certainly looks efficient. But the clay still has to be wet clay, and here comes the water. When you drink out of a cup, you don't expect to cut your lip on a chip of marble, but you might if it weren't for this operation of sieving. Potters are fussy. Their clay must not be too thick and not too thin, but just right. Specific gravity tests check up on it. The water's done its job of mixing up the ingredients, and now it must be squeezed out. What remains is the real stuff of pot making. If you're a connoisseur of pottery, you've heard of biscuit ware. This is the biscuit. Talking of words, this process is called pugging. You speak of a pug nose, one that's pressed back into its wearer's face. Clay is pressed back into itself to form what they call the pug. To turn the pug's clay into a simple thing like a cup is as straightforward as you would imagine. This is how it is done. And equally simply, they're dried by being put on the ground. Making a plate is just the same as pressing your signet ring onto ceiling wax. Working at this speed, the question of whether the plate will be good or bad is already settled. It depends on the mixture that's put into the mould. Like the pastry that might very well be the first thing these plates carry, the secret is in the blending. More complicated things are made by pouring what they call casting soup into moulds. It looks as though you can mould almost any shape, from a pot to a battleship. That is not true. As the soup flows in, it plays tricks that might ruin a badly designed mould. But that has not happened here. The men who made these moulds knew every trick of the soup, as well as they know the temperaments of their wives. And the soup has behaved itself. With their skill, they have moulded the features of the men who have moulded India's history. Heaven knows we're all familiar enough with the way the handles of our crockery come off. Here is how they go on.
We've seen pug clay and clay soup. Here is powdered clay, the only sort that makes a satisfactory tile, or as you will see in the next machine, ink pot. The cleaner we get and the cleaner we like our houses, the more we need tiles. Millions upon millions of them. A sort of hygienic highway through our towns and cities. This machine presses them out at a speed to match our demand. But so far, nothing in our story holds water. For that, the cups and all the other objects must be baked after being set out in clay containers. In fact, it cannot be done properly anywhere but in these special ovens, where years of experience go to keeping them at just the right temperature. Millions of figures taught potters just how hot to get their pots just how long to let them cool. It doesn't occur to you when you buy a cup that if you put tea in it, the tea will ooze out onto the tablecloth. It might if this baking wasn't properly timed. After the technician comes the artist. The color is put on by hand and kept on by burning rather like painting a picture and setting it alight. For mass production, the brush gives way to the spray gun, and by its means, an even, lustrous color can be laid on in no time at all. Not that it's a mere matter of pressing a trigger. Spray painting is as difficult to do properly as laying on a wash in watercolors. When it comes to painting the lines on plates, it seems that one more lever and the whole thing could be done by a machine. Next comes the glazing. The article is washed and then specially coated. Then they manufacture separators which will keep the articles from fouling each other in the next process. They're now on their way to the final baking. The expert on pottery distinguishes several different ways of glazing, and indeed, apart from the design of a pot or a plate, its merit lies in the quality of its glaze. And naturally, it follows that in this Gualia factory, each article is closely scrutinized to detect a crack or flaking in the glaze. If they find any, the article goes on the scrap heap. However large the variety of things they make, each one must go out with a sheen like a new pin. They work to a high standard. Glance over this little exhibition at the Indian potter's art. Some of the rarest and most sought after collector's pieces in the world are just simple pots and vases. Here, for everyone to buy, are things which are both inexpensive and beautiful. The manager in his office can look back over the whole process, from the clay and the earth to the shining piece ready for sale. These master potters turn the very stuff of the soil of India into beauty. Another Indian in